everyone. Thanks so much for tuning back into Everyone Talks to Liz. So glad you're checking in. I, I'm very interested to know what you guys have been doing to pass the recent time. I mean, we've been doing this for months now. I know we're all eager to see live and brand new television shows. We want live sports. Let's just be honest. Even if we're not sports fans, we're so excited to see anything live that we're saying, oh, suddenly I just adore live lacrosse. But it's NFL football I am dying for. And you know what? The NFL still does look to restart on September 10th. But as we get closer to that deadline, we know this. About 60 NFL players have opted out of the football season, citing coronavirus concerns. Okay, I get that. Totally fine. But I need to see my Browns. I'm really jonesing to see Cleveland finally win the Super Bowl. Stop laughing. This week, the U.S. has reached a total of 5 million coronavirus cases with you know, no end in sight for this pandemic. What does this mean for the NFL season, for my Cleveland Browns, for college football, sports in general, and whipping it all together in the same bowl business? This week's podcast guest checks all those boxes. He's a two-time Super Bowl champ. He's a business leader who has never taken the traditional route, either on or off the field. I'd like to welcome former Patriots defensive end Jarvis Green to Everyone Talks to Liz. How you hey, doing? Great to have you. Thank you thank for joining you. Everyone Talks to Liz. Yes, thank you for inviting me again. Definitely. It's an honor. Tell me where you are right now. I'm in my home in Baton Rouge. Uh, just bought a new house, I guess, three weeks ago me and my older brother. So I've been cutting the grass, washing the cars, doing the, the daily routine as a house Wait a minute. You, you're running an entire massive shrimping business <laughs> and right? you're cutting your own lawn? Yeah, come on. <laughs> hey, I, I'm normal like everyone else, you know. Um, but like today, it's Monday, but I want to get out, stay busy, you know, just, mm-hmm. just, just, just out of time is the devil's workshop, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yes. so we, we whack her here, picking grass, watering <laughs> the lawn, you know, washing the truck, you know, getting ready for the day. I know after this, I got to go ship some stuff out, working on, just working on everything, you know, so yeah. um, you, you know how it is. Oh, I yeah. love your story, Jarvis, and I know that our listeners will love your story because not only have you had such an amazing National Football League career, but what a business leader you have become. But I want to get to a little bit of news here. You know, we're hearing, and it may well, by the time this this podcast drops, it may well become reality that the Big Ten is possibly going to cancel its football season. That, to me, is a a kick in the stomach, considering I covered a million Ohio State-Michigan games during my time in, in Columbus, Ohio, as a newscaster. But I know what football means to the SEC, where, you know, you played, and of course, the, the Big Ten, the Pac-10. I went to Berkeley. What is the, what is the real ramification of, of a cancellation? It's more mental than anything for the guys that's playing, uh, the coaches. They're there. This is the time to go back to training camp, you know, put the pads on. And you have this COVID, uh, you know, coronavirus that's here. And that is really just for the economy. And now it's, it's about to do another part, you know, with the sports world. And everybody, I know from the SEC playing, you know, SEC football, this is like, uh, it's like church. It's tradition. I mean, this is routine. And these next, you know, 10 to 12, 14 weeks, everybody will be tailgating, watching the game, supporting their local teams. And not to have any football, I don't know what tragedy this is going to do, but it's going to, it's not going to be pretty at all for anyone, not just about financial but also just the, the kids. I mean, what about the seniors? These guys are lost right now. And like, what am I supposed to do? How am I going to get some film? I got the draft. I got other things that's coming up in my life. And what do I supposed to do now? I'm supposed to stop? Doesn't the draft, won't the NFL and Roger Goodell have to take that into consideration? They have to. I mean, we saw the draft. It was up with 37%. Everybody was at home watching the, watching the draft on TV. Yeah. That's awesome. But the draft is not played on the field. It is not. And the games, this is something that we often take in consideration. For me, my thing is that it's like that one-year mulligan that the entire country will have, will have to have a mulligan for everybody in the country at every level. I mean, sports is one thing because you can't get those years back. 
you see the guys opting out the 60 players you talked about and yeah they they got put it on the back end but mentally that is going to be the biggest stress for everybody can you tell me how stressful it was back when you were in the draft and the and the right. childhood that led up to that I mean, okay, so for, for me, when I got drafted, it was a train wreck for me because I, I went to LSU, I graduated. Uh, I had no idea where I was going. The way it is now with all the players going, traveling, getting their visits, going check on different teams before the draft, unfortunately, I didn't do that because I was in the first or second round draft pick. Mm-hmm. And being a fourth round draft pick, I had no idea. So, so it was different, right? We had, what, two days? You had the first round, the first day. Then you had second to the sixth round the second day. And you had these teams talking to you, to, to my agent, no idea. We, and we had guys that we was talking to that I, I've never met them. I never talked to them. Yeah, I worked out for the combine. Mm-hmm. I wasn't in my best shape, ran a slow 40, jumped terribly, bench press, did all my drills terribly. So I was really hoping for to be a free agent just to make a team, you know, and got drafted by the Patriots in the fourth round. Uh, never talked to the Patriots now one time. But I know it had something to do with Nick Saban and Bill Belichick. Their relationship, I mean, it's worth a, it, look, it was worth a million dollars and more. Um, but coming, you know, going back, you know, back to my childhood, again, we, you know, people know that I, I, I quit my first day of football and just going through the, the motion, working out, doing different things, trying to be different, trying to separate myself from the pack. And, and, and I made, you know, a name for myself as a hard worker, a great player on the field and off the field and, and a great person. You know, so a lot of it has to do with the NFL draft coming from college to NFL because now the way they look at players, they look at the background, checks, the mm-hmm. history, to yeah. see what type of player that the, that the teams are drafting now. Yeah, psychological tests and things like that. Yes. Yeah. Growing up, who was your inspiration for all of the things that you just discussed, not just being a, a different type of player, but also a good person, as you just said? I have to say the people I grew up with in my house, you know, I mean, I was a guy that I didn't care about. I mean, I got teased a lot. I, I didn't care about that. I Why? Cared more about, well, I mean, nobody's perfect. My mom always taught us that, that no one's perfect. You know, people are going to tease you. People are going to laugh at you. But you have to do you have to do what you, you have to do first. That's mm-hmm. the most important thing. Not what other people tell you to do or what they want you to do. do you know, make sure you feel comfortable with whatever you're doing and don't do it for anyone else. So for me growing up, uh, getting teased that was, was the people that teased me, I said, you know, I'm going to get them back some way, somehow. You know, so all that happened. I met all my enemies. I met all my ghosts, you know, in the closets. I mean, I, I've been through all that in those phases of life. Uh, but my mom, I mean, my dad, my, my, my older brothers, my sister, my auntie, my grandmother, everybody was an inspiration for me in my house growing up in the South. Yeah, we, we called that mishpucha, you know, the whole family. Yes. Um, <laughs> to, <laughs> you know, as we, as we look at all that is Jarvis Green, I mean, you had all those Super Bowls, but, you know, as you know, people didn't really believe in you as a star frontline player but success is the best revenge, is it not? And you were with the Patriots, and during that time, what was the number one thing you learned from the coach, Coach Bill Belichick, and what he created for you as an experience that you use today in your business world? I know people always talk about athletes, y'all say the same thing over and over and over again, adversity, adversity. Fighting through adversity, uh, you know, I mentioned before we talked about having amnesia, about when you fail. I mean, you have so much more in front of you that you have to keep trying because how many things we do in life that we that we could give up so easily, you know? And all of us, I mean, we could say that now, but we learn from our mistakes. You're supposed to learn from your mistakes. So, I mean, at times, from the first time I quit football and things would get hard, that extra set, that extra lap, that extra mile... I mean, just the extra, I mean, just that believing in yourself and getting it done. Because mm-hmm. a lot of things that I've done in my life, I feel in so many things. You hear Michael Jordan, you hear Tiger Woods, you hear Wayne Gretzky. You hear all the greats talk about failing over and over and over again. But kids today, it's so different, right? The things they do, they play video games all day, right? That's what kids yeah. do. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I was young, I watched games on TV. I watch all the greats play and I watch guys strike out over and over. They hit a homer, win the game. They're mm-hmm. back on top. But that's that's life. Adversity. Getting through the 
the tough times, and, and I'm, they're only going to make you tougher. You know, so playing with Belichick, playing with Coach Saban, um, I mean, that's been the biggest thing for me, adversity. Getting over it, fighting, keep going. Jarvis, do you think kids today give up too easily? Yes, too easily. They don't try. I have three kids. I mean, they, they, they don't. Most of the, I mean, even like when it comes to working, I mean, I worked at Walmart when I, when I had a full scholarship at LSU. I had two jobs working for five years. I worked, I worked. And I mean, things were, it was hard. Went to school, uh, practice. I failed on a lot of things. I mean, I wasn't the best student. Uh, I'm, I failed classes. I had to take them over again. I took chemistry three times in college. Finally made that C. That was a tough C to make. <gasps> but I passed oh. chemistry. But I mean, I did it, you know. And I think kids today, they don't understand. I mean, it, it's, it's, it does a lot to them mentally when they give up so, so fast because they don't understand they have a whole life in front of them. And people judge them off. And kids don't understand. Can they say, you know what? I'm going to go find the, the, the next job. I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to do something that's easy. Er. So you were saying you've got three kids. I have two. And I feel like, you know, my dad grew up super poor. In fact, he's convinced that he <laughs> was short because he didn't have enough food during the Depression to eat because he came from a family of nine. I was like, okay, Dad, make me feel guilty because yes, now I'm living in Beverly Hills. Yeah. But he ended up fighting through all that adversity, became a surgeon, and we were raised in complete comfort. I was very lucky. But I, yeah. I still had that ambition. I don't know where I got it, probably from my father who said, fight and you got to make your life your own. But now I, my own kids, I feel like it's slipping away. Like it's too, it, it's too many generations out now and mm -hmm. I've done something wrong because they don't work. <laughs> they do give right. up really easily yeah. on little things. Yeah. They're great kids, but well, what do we do? I mean... The thing I think we can do is keep preaching to them and tell them over and over and they hate to hear about it. And we all have our old war stories. Times when we had our, our chance and we had to, you know, go against the grain with the belief in ourselves, and we had mm -hmm. chances that we could have gave up. Uh, I tell my kid about, my, like, like right now, I tell my, like, like, right, okay, like right now presently, like I had my tough spell, you know, I retired. But I told the kids that just didn't happen because I sat around and didn't do anything. I earned that on the field, you know, and then as far as the business world, it's the same thing. So, like, I tell my kids now because today they, they see a second career and they see my success, but they've seen my bad days. They've seen my bad days. And, you know, and, and I, I played football. I made some good money. But, like, the things I'm doing now, this is things that I've, I created, not off of football, off of money, just from, from bare bones. Well, let's get to that world after football for you. A couple of years out, you founded Oceans 97. Of course, 97 was your jersey number. But the path you had to take to get to that is so fascinating. It, it so strangely came about. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, Oceans 97 is an international shrimp company. You've got eight different flavors of shrimp. You export all around the world. But what I think is so fascinating is how you got into shrimp, which you admit you didn't even used to like. It's sort of like the Bubba Gump shrimp story from Hollywood. But tell us... Tell us how that came about. Uh, okay, so I go back to a friend of mine, owed him a favor, and um, he asked me to help his family to sell shrimp. You know, and I was more like, well, I don't know anything about shrimp. I know how it tastes. I like to eat <laughs> shrimp. And, and, and got into, uh, you know, internship six months. And I tell people the story, and I remember some people that didn't really know me, they, always, they say, like, if you're in this for the money, you're in the wrong profession. And I sit there, I get pissed. I said, you don't know that I had a mop in the room and worked six months without pay and learned everything from the bottom up. I learned the business. I wanted to be someone in that business. And was it easy? The road wasn't easy. People told me you shouldn't be here. You don't belong here. And being an African-American in the shrimp business, that's rare. So a lot of times for me, when I had my meetings, I was the only black guy in the room. Still, today, when I have, you know, my shrimp discussions and, and I'm growing and, I mean, I had my ups and downs, but I just I always tell my kids, I mean, I had to work. I had to earn this, 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 this job. I had to earn this title. No one say, hey, man, you got a million dollars. 
open his shrimp facility, you got all the brand, you got all the sauces, you got all the shrimp you need, and go sell shrimp. It wasn't that way. It didn't happen that way. You know, so when people see where I'm at today, yeah, I mean, I've made some money, lost some money, but creating, creating. I went to school for engineering. So creating something, put it out to the market. And the thing about that is people have to like it. You have to promote it. You have to market it. It costs money to, all, to do all those different things. So I'm sitting here now today, what, five years, six years in, and now, like you said, I have the chance to sell to the world. Well, Amazon is that lift for me. You know, but I do sell in local supermarkets like a Rouse's Market, Chris Specialty Meats. I sell in a few, a few different stores in the Boston, Northeast area. But, but I mean, I've done, done the big chains. I've done all that. Mm-hmm. I've had, I had my shot with Walmart. It didn't work. I had my shot with other companies. But still, adversity. Do yes. not give up. That's business. Keep well, trying. They, Keep working. They say the hero is the, the man who falls and gets up. That's the hero. You're right. Yeah. The hero is the man who falls and gets up. This is Everyone Talks to Liz, and we'll be right back. So you're, you're doing this friend a favor, and you're working for free as an internship there. How old were you at that point? I was 32, 33. And you're mopping floors? Yes, mopping floors. And I was doing demos. I was doing cooking demos when I got... You know, I started understanding more about the lingo of the business, but my mm-hmm. first two, three weeks, yeah, mopping floors, cleaning. I had to clean the factory every day. When I was at work, we had to clean and wash down every day, sanitize. Uh, you know, we, 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 we clean a little bit before, we clean after. We had to dump all the shrimp heads and all the guts. I did that every day. I stinked every time I came home. Um, had, to, had to do the same thing over and over. And it was more like, I remember my old boss used to laugh at me and giggle like, do you really want to do this? I'm like, yeah, I'm here. I drove. I showed up. I want to work. You know, so a month passed, two months passed, six months, a year, a year and a half, two years. And we, we was rolling. Mm-hmm. We was traveling around the country. We was, I was, look, and then I, was, I remember going to all these different seminars and different exporting um, deals and learning the business and meeting with government officials and SBA, I mean, uh, commerce, everything. And, and I can tell you what is funny. We're going to talk about this later. But in the beginning, I didn't really tell you what I was doing also on the pivot with this COVID because I got into like selling PPE. Mm-hmm. And all of this really happened because I got into the shrimp business, learning import, exports, dealing with, you know, Asian companies, foreign companies, dealing with customs. I just didn't retire and somebody went and put a chip in my head and say, hey, you're going to to know everything about exporting and importing right now. So I know I have a lot of younger friends. I'm 41 now. I have a lot of younger friends and they see or they always have this opinion about how to do things. I say, you just graduated out of college. You have no idea what you don't know anything, anything. So I get that a lot of times, and, mm-hmm. and then I have all the people that I know that's successful that does business. And my thing is, like, when I got into the seafood business, I said, I'm not doing anything else. I will make this work no matter what. Are you cash flow positive? Tell me how your business is doing, even during the coronavirus. Well, I'm going to say with the shrimp, it was very slow. I remember February, well, January, February. So I remember I had a meeting with Kroger. Um, so hopefully that works out. It's going to be shrimp spread. Uh, for Kroger. So I'm praying that that works out. Uh, you know, you got so many things you have to do, but I know mm-hmm. I have a great supplier that, that we could do this and that we could, uh, we could provide the product for Kroger. So Thanks. right now, COVID hit, things shut down. Ocean 97, I mean, beside the stores that I'm in now, I got those, you know, those sales, but everything shut down for me. And I can remember I'm sitting here like, what to do, what to do. I got into trying to sell some ground beef uh, to some stores in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. Had some conversations, and then one day, one of my um, so I'm working with corrections, and somebody was like, "Hey, Jarvis, uh, can you get sanitizer?" I said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, I can." Look, I'm sh- I'm not I'm shaking my head. No people can't see, but I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't know I don't know anything about sanitizer. So that's how it kind of started. So I started doing some research, calling people, mm-hmm. working on sanitizer. And that didn't work out. And then some bids came up for Louisiana, the state government. 
I want some beds with sanitizer. I want some beds with PPE, some masks, KN95s, and then I want uh, some beds with the military. Some I can't say the state, but it's a big, it's, it's a big state, uh, Midwest. Yeah. I want a I want a huge bed with some you know with some help from others, but I you know I got my government number and all that good stuff, and I got into selling PPE. This is a perfect example of when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Yes. So, so like before that, I mean, business was slow. I was pretty much just, just you know, um, I was back and forth northeast. I was trying to sell my shrimp product and up in the north from other places. I was working on Amazon at the same time. And things just blew up. Blew up. Mm. I mean, I, I don't want to sit here and talk about numbers, but I mean, gigantic. For just a dream come true working hard, nonstop, pivoting in a time of crisis and making the best out of what I had. And I mean, mm-hmm. like now things have been crazy, getting POs, orders, delivering, PPE products, doing more things. So wow. I had to go get a, another company, you know, so I could, you know, to kind of separate Ocean's 97 from the PPE, you know, industry and learning things like that. And it's been crazy and i'm still in this and when this first started i wasn't looking to do this at all but this has consumed most of my time now right you know right. and i gotta say i'm thankful look i'm in a new house bought a new house i'm thankful wow you know so i um, very happy uh, i'm working on this stuff i mean i'm writing stuff down now that i have some calls and phone mm-hmm. blowing up every day so i get up like everybody else, I get on my phone, I do my yard work. I always have my earpiece in, earpiece in I'm wee whacking, taking calls. <laughs> it's a blessing. It's a blessing. See, now I love this. It is so inspirational. You know, we don't need celebrities or big time CEOs who just had an easy ride. What we do here is we want to know what it feels like for people who climb to the top. For example, you, you got that Super Bowl ring on your finger. Well, two of them. And then having to go work for free after that experience, mopping the floors. Few people in the world can say that they have both been an NFL player and then stopped everything, been without work, and then gone on to create a successful business, which is what you've done with Ocean's 97. Um, You know, getting all these contracts and then everything freezes because of the pandemic, as you call it, the year of the mulligan. But instead of just throwing in the towel, you actually just started an entirely new business when your shrimping business went cold. And now you're actually making bank. That is so exciting. Liz, I am making bank. And, <laughs> and, and I'm, so like now it's like the Amazon about to finally launch. I've been telling people that's going to launch almost for a year. But working on different things, add more flavors, uh, not just USA, but trying to, well, we're launching in Canada, Mexico, USA, Japan, and Europe. Mm-hmm. So just wow. getting all my stuff together, all my trademarks, you know, all just lining everything up. So I got to say, my lawyers, my, my, my counselors, they've been very busy um, just getting things ready, you know, fulfillment centers, third-party companies, distribution. That's the things I've been doing, you know. So it, it never stops, you know. And I know a lot of people... I know a lot of people, I mean, retired guys, and they sit at home and they're kind of flipping a coin, like, what to do. You know what? I always tell the guys, man, just pick up the phone and reach out to some of your, your alumni. Talk yeah. to them. Because for us, I see guys during the Super Bowl and we catch up. But after that, I don't see the guys anymore until the Super Bowl next year or the NFL draft. But it's like, I go to the union every year. I go to my union office every year. I try to go and and, and, and fist bump and talk to everybody, say hello, I'm here, you know, just to stay active, um, mm-hmm. you know. So I'll, I'm always doing that. But I think more guys, when they retire, they need to just t- tap on somebody. Yeah. I remember one, one time me and Vince Wilfork was selling crawfish in Houston. He hit me up. I put him with some of my crawfish guys in Louisiana. They were sell- selling crawfish, you know. I mean, little things. like, And, and, and I mean – that's a blessing that we could go and do that. I mean, everybody else does that in the world. They go network with people in their field. Right. Jarvis, what is the difference between a crawfish and a, is a crawfish a mini lobster? 
No, what it's is not. It? It's not. People look at it that way, but they're two different things. I mean, crawfish grow in the mud. They grow in rice paddies. Mm-hmm. It's a little different. They all look alike, but they taste completely different. They're probably from the same family. I have no idea. I just thought it messing with crawfish. Um, I have no idea, but I mean, look, I love lobsters. I mean, I love Maine lobsters all mm-hmm. day. Just a different taste. Uh, crawfish. The root, the the, thing, the biggest thing about crawfish is that you got to boil it. You know, we season it with all the high sodium spices, and we have a traditional crawfish boil. You have your, you know, you have your different vegetables. You put in there whatever it is: potatoes, squash, cauliflower, carrots. <laughs> you got all your okay. sausages. Yeah, it's different. It it can't be lost on you that I'm seeing that scene in Forrest Gump where he right. says, "You got your this shrimp, you got your that shrimp, oh, bubble, you got, you got bubble." Shrimp. Yeah, yeah, they was on the floor with the toothbrush. Yeah, pineapple shrimp, barbecue shrimp, shrimp frequency. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) shrimp sandwich. I I think that's about it. Yeah. Look, look. I I think that's about it. That 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 movie was a great movie, and and it's funny for me because everywhere I used to go, people used to call me Bubba. And I know I had an article. I said I still don't call me Bubba because I always tell people I'm more like Tom Hanks. But just to be on the bayou. Uh. And just to get into the factories on the shrimp boats, I mean, it's, it's, I tell you, it's some, it's tradition, it's life, but it's amazing just to experience that. Yes. That, that side of the industry, you know, all the way from, you know, you can go out fishing in the Gulf of Maine. I've done that so many times with a, with a great uh, captain named, named Tim Ryder out there. So just learning all different phases of the, 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 the fishing, the seafood industry has been a blessing for me and it's been fun. I want to get to this issue because I'm big on protecting the planet. Ocean plastic turns my stomach both literally and figuratively, truly upsets me to see trash in the ocean. You've got to tell me because you work with these creatures of the sea. You've been out at sea. You've got this shrimp business that you want to see as a sustainable one. You want to see a healthy ocean. You also want to see a healthy American fishing industry. What don't people know? Should there be legislation in some way that makes it stronger instead of weaker to protect both our oceans and the fishing industry? I'm going to say this. Every other country in the world subsidizes seafood. Not every other. Most countries mm-hmm. in the world subsidize seafood. We subsidize agriculture, corn, rice, beans, sugar, right? And we're also doing different things when it comes to the grain, to the alcohol, right? Making, you know, beer and making, you know, spirits. Seafood in America is not subsidized. If they want to help local fishermen succeed in America, subsidize seafood. Vietnam, India, South America, China, uh, Thailand, all those different countries, it's, it's subsidized. Mm-hmm. The government pays for all of this. Now, of course, they're digging holes into the earth, and it's a cesspool. That's what it is. Now, unless you're close to the ocean, you have the, the, the influx of the water, the ocean, mixing you know, with, with, with the farm, that's, that's a little different. Some countries mm-hmm. are doing that. They have great product. But in America, we need more of that because, I mean, when I call for a shrimp facility and ask for shrimp, like today, it's hard that, hey, we don't have any boats out. We don't have this out. We don't have that out. So it's right. really, it's, it's dying, I mean, swiftly uh, with the seafood industry, especially shrimp. Mm. I can only imagine. And then, of course, making our oceans sustainable. It, it is. And it, it, it sucks to see when you're out there and then you see people dumping trash in the ocean. Oh. He's, he, he, look, the, the guys, you go out to go fish, if it's, you know, if it's rec- recreational, if, if it's commercial, Take care of the ocean. Keep your trash in the boats. Bring it back to the dock. Dump it there. Don't dump it in the ocean. The fish, they can't eat that. They can't. And then the big ones, what do they do? They just swallow it. Now they have a stomach full of plastics. They're mm-hmm. going to die eventually. All the way yeah. down to all the sea turtles, all the way down you know, to the mammals, to the fish that's in the ocean, to the bottom. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not good. It's not safe. And we got to eat that fish. I mean, that's part of our diets. It's, it's mm-hmm. the food chain. Speaking of the food chain, let's talk about the college football food chain, which can be brutal. Let's finish on that. Having experienced it at one of the top universities, LSU, do you think that college athletes should be paid? Absolutely. Um, 
the guys, a lot of guys are not going to make it to the next level. They're not. And what they put their body through every day, mm-hmm. my five years, I mean, I remember, in the, I remember my time in the classroom, but I remember my times on the field practicing injuries, surgeries, concussions. Um, I feel like, I feel like, like when I get up, I feel like I'm 41 years old, you know, stay mm-hmm. active, work out. But like for me, like it's, it's, it's taxing on your body mentally, physically, even socially. And I think. And the schools every, make so much money. I mean, look, coaches are making eight to nine million dollars a year. Head coaches, assistant coaches are making one to two million dollars a year. And the player getting his little Pell Grant and, you know, $25,000, $30,000. And he's doing the most sacrificing out there for his body, her body. Mm-hmm. I mean, you should ask these now, most of them banged up. I mean, you telling me they don't deserve some type of stipend? And they're building all these different buildings and stadiums and, and classrooms because off the back of all the players on the field, they deserve pay. And I see some of the stuff on uh, social media about if they could get paid, what these guys would get paid. Now, I'm going to say this. Because of what your position is, I, I know there should be kind of like a hierarchy on Foyds, but it has to be relative and realistic. You can't have – I mean, you're not sitting there saying, I want to pay somebody 300 grand a year – to throw a football in college. I mean, because the scholars got a scholarship, number one. You know, they're giving you a, a chance to come play sports. You got a free scholarship, ac- academic scholarship, or the athletic scholarship. But you, they deserve something. Everybody's different. When I played ball, we had a, I had a summer job every summer. You know, I mean, the most I made in one year was $5,000 in the summer. That's what I made. So I had to go summer school. I had to go lift weights mm-hmm. and, and do all of that. So they do deserve to get paid. What? I don't know, but something. Well, I guess we'll know soon enough if there's even going to be a college football season this time around and the ramifications of that. But in the meantime, what an opportunity you carved out for yourself. People always say, oh, I got this great opportunity. I was given this opportunity. No, Jarvis, we are hearing from you that you scratched it out. It sounds like you fought for every single thing you have in life. What would you say to people today who think, Oh, you know, he was gifted naturally. He ended up at the NFL. You got two Super Bowl rings. You've got your company. What's the one characteristic you had that you say makes you the success today that you see now? Hard work pays off. Adversity is only a word that you have to live by it. Um, Once you have that taste in your mouth, you should want to move forward, to thrive in whatever you're doing. Um, and I always tell people this, too. I didn't start playing football when I was 19. I started playing football in the seventh grade. But when I started playing football in the seventh grade, I never had, like, the dream to say I want to play NFL football. Mm-hmm. I kept working hard and, um, you know, cream of the crop, rise to the top. You know, but you got to keep working. You just, you know, <laughs> a, 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 a lot of people are gifted with a – I mean, I was the biggest guy on the field. A lot of people's gifted with their ability that they know there was going to be a professional player, uh, whatever it is, or any sport. But, I mean, working hard, is that's part of it. That's 80% of it is working hard. It's being um, – having a routine, uh, being disciplined, keeping your nose clean, staying out of trouble. I mean, it's, it's not just one thing. You know, you could be a great athlete, but, you know, you got terrible grades, you don't listen to anybody, you disrespect everybody, you'll never make it. So never give up. Jarvis, we're – Honored to have you on Everyone Talks to Liz. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And it is a story that I know has many more fantastic and riveting chapters to come. Thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you. Y'all enjoy your day. Jarvis Green of Oceans 97, two-time Super Bowl champ for the Patriots and all-around amazingly inspirational human. Thank you so much. And thank you guys so much for listening. I hope that each time that you tune into the podcast, you really get a sense of what it takes to make it to the top and then to hold that position. Yes, it's a tough climb. And yes, at the end, your fingers may be bloodied proverbially, but Look at Jarvis. He enjoyed the climb and he absorbed it and he appreciates it. On that note, I'll see you Monday through Friday on the Fox Business Network for the Claim and Countdown, all important final hour of trade. Have a great day, you guys. For more podcasts like this, go to foxnewspodcasts.com.